Hi friends, it's Talking Heads of Atasca Cita. My name is Amy Bridwell, and I have the great privilege of being on the phone with Monsignor James Golazinski on this beautiful, sunny Labor Day. And Monsignor, this past week, Texas has been rocked by a new law, a new abortion law, that says abortion is illegal if a heartbeat is detected. Praise God. Praise God for that. You, would you like to talk about that this Labor Day? Yes, I would. So let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And direct us, O Lord, and all our actions, that every work and prayer may begin with thee, and through thee be successfully completed, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And St. Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, I decided to try to find out if the uh, Texas AF, uh, AFL-CIO had made any statements about the new law uh, protecting the lives of the unborn from the time that their hearts start beating. Mm -hmm. That's the way I prefer to talk about it, not mm -hmm. so much to say anti-abortion, but it's more a case of uh, child protection. Yes. From the time that uh, their hearts start beating. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we did find a statement. It wasn't uh, an official statement, it seems, uh, but the only thing we could find was a statement from a person who's in charge of uh, policies for the state AFL CIO. Mm -hmm. And the uh, person who uh, in that position, condemned the law. Mm. Now, I wasn't all that surprised mm -hmm. because some years ago, I remember when uh, there was uh, a national election for the national head, of, uh, the head of the national AFL-CIO. There were two Catholic men who uh, were the leading candidates, and it seemed like they tried to outdo one another mm -hmm. in their support of Roe versus Wade. Hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, I got on the internet to, to uh, see what the situation at the national level is at this time. And to my surprise, last month, in, in August, less than a month from now, or from uh, a month ago, uh, there was a national election, and for the first time, a woman was elected to be the president of the national AFL-CIO. So mm -hmm. I don't know if she has issued a statement or not. Mm -hmm. And it represents such a vast change. When I was young, the president of the AFL-CIO, who was an Irish Catholic by the name of Meany, George, I believe was his first name, George Meany, and he was a loyal, loyal Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I should have, I guess, looked to see if I could have found any statements that he made mm -hmm. uh, at the time of uh, the Supreme Court decision in, in 73. Mm -hmm. But he uh, was a faithful Catholic. Mm -hmm. And now the labor movement, which was heavily Catholic uh, for most of its history, uh, has been undermined, and I can't say that it has a Catholic identity anymore. Mm -hmm. There was a Italian communist philosopher named uh, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci. I think we've talked about him before. It seems like it. Well, he lived at the time of World War One, and the success of the uh, communist revolution in Russia in 1917, and then its solidification of power in the civil war that took place. Mm -hmm. The one we talked about last week, remember? Yes. Where American troops were sent to uh, up in the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, they were confident there was going to be a revolution without borders that what began there in Russia was going to sweep across Europe, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And Gramsci uh, gave an answer. He said the problem was the people of Europe were too religious. Mm. And before the 
communist revolution could continue, uh, there it had to the population had to be more secularized. And I would say maybe that is what has happened. Uh, some people have used the expression about marching through our institutions. And uh, that is what has taken place in our country to a great extent. Uh, our institutions have been, been, they've been infused into our institutions, something that took them away uh, from a religious people and, and then turn these institutions into instruments yes. of secularism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it reminded me too uh, this morning about how back in the uh, early 90s, the National Right to Life organization had their convention here in Houston over Labor Day weekend. I had a little minor role to play in it. It was something wonderful for me because Father Frank Pavone had just become head of Priest for Life, and he had an exhibit at that convention, and I met him there, and we've been like brothers ever since. Mm -hmm. And anyway, one of the first churches where he offered Mass uh, after he became president of Priest for Life was Annunciation. I invited him to come, and he took the 9.30 Mass that Sunday morning. Uh, I'm getting a little off topic. One of the speakers at the uh, convention uh, is a person named Beverly Clark. Do you recognize the name? No. Beverly Clark was one of the first uh, black women to be elected to uh, our city council. Mm -hmm. And uh, she retired, I guess, after a census. Uh, then the, the congressional districts were reorganized. And, of course, Houston always gaining more and more and more population. We have more and more uh, realignment of uh, congressional districts. And there was a new district in, as I recall, in southeast Houston. And so she filed in the Democrat Party primary. And anyway, she wanted to try to get the endorsement of labor. Mm -hmm. And she, in this talk she gave, she told about how she went before the... Uh, Oh, they have a term that they use uh, in connection with endorsements. Uh, I can't remember it right now. But anyway, she went before this board mm. and made her pitch. And what a person does, I think she was one of the five candidates, uh, five seeking the candidacy, I guess we should say she was a candidate wannabe. Mm -hmm. And anyway, she made her pitch and argued about how she would be good for labor mm -hmm. if uh, they would endorse her, and then she should be elected to this seat, this new seat in, uh, in the House of Representatives. And after she made her pitch, then there was a question and answer period. Mm -hmm. and she told us the first question she got was, where do you stand on, you want to guess? Abortion. Mm. That's right. Mm -mm -mm. That's right. That was the first question. Mm -hmm. And she answered that oh, she disapproved of Roe versus Wade, and she was dead in the water. This morning, very early, uh, I was listening to the radio at 6 o'clock, and I was listening to the Hugh Hewitt show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had guests. Oh, come on, let me put it back. It wasn't a live show. It was a uh, tape of a previous show. I, I imagine what they do is they play this uh, program f f uh, over and over on uh, Labor Day. And he had with him the president of Hillsdale College, Larry Orrin. And uh, also there was a, one of the faculty, I think his name was West. And the three of them were discussing the history, uh, the history uh, of the past couple hundred years or so. And much of it was devoted to what happened in Russia with the ta takeover of Marxism, the great, great deal of discussion about Marx mm -hmm. and then Lenin mm -hmm. and then Stalin and on and on and on and on and on and on. But at one point, uh, they brought up why, why did not the working class in the United States take the Marxist bait? Hmm. Unlike many, many, many uh, countries in uh, Europe, many countries in Europe, a uh, substantial portion of uh, the laboring class was affected by 
uh, Marxism, just like uh, Antonio Gramsci said they had to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, they just touched on it. And they missed something that uh, a lot of people no longer are are aware of. One of the reasons why the uh, blue-collar workers of the United States did not follow the Marxist model is for uh, the fact that they were heavily, heavily Catholic. I mean, we had so, so, so many uh, recent immigrants and their children who had come uh, from your uh, Catholic portions of, of Europe. Mm-hmm. And anyway, uh, one of the things that took place during that period, after World War World War One, was the labor priests' work. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say the labor priests' work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, you know, all of our big city in the north and the east had Catholic colleges. Mm-hmm. And in many of them, at night, there was a, a program set up to educate, uh, to educate the people who were involved in the American Union movement, mm-hmm. not according to uh, Das Kapital right. and Karl Marx, yes. but using the papal encyclical. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Leo the Thirteenth, and then later, uh, forty years after Leo the Thirteenth, then Pius the Eleventh yes. uh, gave uh, another encyclical on principles of this art. Mm-hmm. And anyway, uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, why the United States did not uh, suffer what happened in many many European countries. Yes. For example, in Italy and in France. There were powerful, powerful non-communist uh, movements among the laboring class. Mm-hmm. One of the uh, one of the reasons why it collapsed is uh, because of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Mm-hmm. Al- Al- Alexander Solzhenitsyn he came along and wrote his book of the Gulag Archipelago, mm-hmm. and it was first published in uh, translated and published in French in uh, Paris and in other languages. And he revealed, huh? He revealed all, all, <laughs> revealed the dark side yes. mm-hmm. of, of Russian communism. Mm-hmm. And anyway, this is what finally was the the, the nail and the coffin mm-hmm. uh, of European uh, European Marxism. Mm-hmm. Now, these labor priests here in our country were educating huh? educating these Catholic Union leaders. Mm-hmm. As to what uh, the, what were the principles that they should be following, and that is one of the reasons why the uh, that Marxism didn't succeed in this country like it did in uh, in much of Europe. Yeah, I didn't know that. Thankfully, that makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. 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 It's interesting. When I was in Korea, part of the time when I was in language school in Seoul, I lived at the Jesuit University there. And guess what? what? One of the priests, Father Basil Price, he was doing there in the uh, 1960s what uh, the labor priests did in, here in this country in the 1920s and 30s. Mm-hmm. He was carrying on. He was carrying on that tradition. Mm-hmm. Oh, what should be the uh, correct principles uh, that unionism, unionism uh, should follow. Mm-hmm. Now, I wonder if they do this in other countries as well. Yeah, I do. Now, the last of these was a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania priest. Uh, his name is Monsignor Leonard Rice. And he was the last one of them to die. He was close to 100 when he died. Mm-hmm. And anyway, he, for many, many decades, wrote a column that... Uh, appeared in the uh, Pittsburgh Diocesan newspaper. And oh, someplace I was in a bookstore and I found out found on sale a book uh, of these columns. Somebody had put together these columns he'd written mm-hmm. over the years in one volume. Mm-hmm. And there are lots and lots and lots of photographs and things of that sort. Yes. 
And so anyway, I bought it. And uh, then later on, Cardinal DiNardo came here. And remember, he's from Pittsburgh. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I visited him one time, and I took the book along, and I said, uh, do you do you know much about this? Monsignor Leonard Wright, <laughs> he was my pastor. Oh, very <laughs> nice. Very, very nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the name of the parish is Christ the King Parish. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I gave him the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, but here's what I'm the reason I'm bringing him into the picture now is over the years in the 1990s, uh, from time to time there would be an article in the Sunday Visitor that he had written. Mm -hmm. They might have taken one of his columns from the Pittsburgh newspaper and, and reprinted it. And over and over and over, he was lamenting, uh, lamenting the fact that uh, the church today uh, did not have the involvement, uh, as was the case in the 1920s and 1930s. He mm -hmm. lamented that, lam mm -hmm. lamented it. It was over and over. Mm -hmm. But you know, when I would read, uh, when I read those columns of his, I say, yeah, but the labor movement changed. Mm -hmm. It changed. Mm -hmm. It was no longer, huh? no longer being animated by leaders like George Meany. Mm -hmm. Yes. What had happened was, oh, you know, remember Gramsci talked about secularization, mm -hmm. marching through, uh, marching through the institutions, mm -hmm. and that is what is what had happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, the even people who were calling themselves Catholic, they were promoting. Uh, they were promoting the anti-life movement here in this country. Yes. And it's still going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that uh, passed through my mind today on Labor Day. Mm -hmm. uh, here in our country, if we wish, we can use one of the voting masses. I think it's number 26. Okay. And the title of the voting mass is for the sanctification of human labor. Mm -hmm. Well, this morning in my homily, I was saying maybe we need to change it here in this country mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for the reform mm -hmm. and the conversion mm -hmm. uh, for the reform and the conversion. Yes, mm -hmm. I can sanctify something as anti-life. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I've done today here on Labor Day. Mm -hmm. I like the way you connected the dots. Mm. By the way, before I end, I want to uh, uh, add on a little, a little postscript to last week. I forgot about something very significant last week. I got so wrapped up in talking about uh, talking about the meaning of Anawim mm -hmm. that <laughs> I, I left out. Uh, something very, very significant. Remember how we talked about how our Lord had unrolled the scroll. He found the place yes. where Isaiah had uh, told about how the coming Messiah, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me and so on and so on and so on. Yes. And then our Lord returned it to the attendant and he sat down. Yes. Now, I think many people, when they... Hear that, read that. Think he went to his usual place <laughs> where he sat in the synagogue. Yes, it's easy. That's what people do. Yes, it's in the same place. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't. No. Nope. You see, the synagogue was a rather small, intimate place, and the person who was in charge of the synagogue after the readings would then sit in front, would sit in front of the, the people there in the synagogue, and then would comment upon what had been read. Yes. It mentions there that our Lord sat down and, and said that all the people were looking at, intently at him. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going on? First of all, he doesn't read the assigned passage, and then he doesn't go back to his regular seat, but he sits down in uh, the chair in front of the rest. Yes. And it doesn't come across very, very clearly uh, as the way St. Luke describes it, but he sat down in front of them. Yes. And, and, and it says they were all looking intently at him. Well, <laughs> what that meant was 
what's going on? Right. They were looking at him. What's going? On? Isn't this Joseph's son? Remember that's part mm-hmm. of the part of the passage. Isn't this Joseph's son? He's not supposed to be sitting there. Yes. Huh? Mm-hmm. And what did he say to them? Oh, he said, "This day you have heard this fulfilled in your presence." Oh, praise God! Praise God! Mm-hmm. Yes. So what he was saying to them was, "I am He." Yes. About whom? I just read from Isaiah. Yes, about whom Isaiah wrote. Yes. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to uh, include that last week. Uh, That's that's essential to getting the full picture of what happened there uh, as he was beginning his public life there and on his first visit back to Nazareth. Yes. Well, if you got really, really involved talking about Anna Ween, I got really, really involved listening. So it works out nicely. <laughs> well, you see, as I said, the synagogue was a rather intimate place. We stand huh, in our churches because when you stand, you can get more volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, originally, um, we didn't have PA systems. Mm-hmm. When I was a boy growing up, many parishes, there was no PA system. The priest who was preaching would stand at the communion rail. Yes. <laughs> and because that was the way to get closest <laughs> to the people in the parish. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you stand, <laughs> you just get more volume. Yes. But because the synagogue was a smaller, more intimate place, uh, the speaker could sit. Mm-hmm. And do you know what the Latin word for chair is? It's called cathedra. And so what what do we call the bishop's church? Cathedral. Yes, cathedral. Yes. Yeah, his church is not called a church. It's called a cathedral. Yes. Because in the bishop's church, there is a chair. Yes. Which is the symbol of him being the chief teacher of the diocese. Mm Mm-hmm. And so that's the reason why we call it uh, we call it uh, cathedral. Yes, that's the, his church, and that chair that he uses uh, when he is uh, presiding uh, in his church uh, is the symbol of the teaching authority of the apostles. The seat of the bishop is in the cathedral. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where that's where the the building gets its name. Mm-hmm. And that's being the location of the, the, the chair that is the symbol of his teaching authority. Mm-hmm. The teaching authority of a, a successor uh, of the apostles. Yes. Very and nice. it goes back. It goes back there to the synagogue. Mm-hmm. Because that was the place of teaching in the, uh, in the old uh, synagogue. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else? I'm excited to hear our new clothes that includes um, our new patroness, Henrietta DeLille. I'm anxious to hear it, Monsignor. Okay. Well, fear not, little flock. It is pleased your father to give you the kingdom. And remember, Anawim, no cross, no crown. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. We'll see you soon, friends. Bye-bye.